Estimates round number three, bivariate estimates. Now remember in algebra, we had an equation. A lot of you saw it as y is equal to mx plus b. We called b the y-intercept, and we called m the slope. Hey, guess what? It's all the same in statistics, dude. So before we had m, now we have b1. And before we had b, now we have b0. Or if you are super sophisticated, you say we've got beta naught and beta one, but only if you're real fancy and stuff. So the first estimate we're gonna talk about is the intercept. In stats, we call the variable on the x-axis, the predictor, and the variable on the y-axis, the outcome. So with that little bit of background, what is the y-intercept? The y-intercept is the predicted value of y when the outcome is equal to zero. So for example, if you are looking at the relationship between height and weight, the y-intercept is the predicted weight of somebody who has no height. Well, that doesn't make sense. By golly, you are right. And that's one of the things about the y-intercept. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. And what I mean by that is sometimes we really don't care what its value is. In those situations, the y-intercept doesn't really help us understand our data, like height. Because really, if you have no height, then you don't exist. And who cares what your weight is? But sometimes we do care about the y-intercept, like Say you wanna look at the relationship between dairy consumption and productivity. So you might wanna know, hey, what is my productivity score if I eat no dairy? 85%, at least in this situation. Well, that's a whole lot of information there. That tells us something about our data. If we go a whole day without eating dairy, the next day, we should expect an 85% productivity score. Hey, I wanna be productive, how about you? So that's the intercept, what about the slope? So you might remember that in algebra, the slope told us how much y changed for every value that x changed. So for example, if the slope was 0.5, that means that every time x changed by one, y changed by 0.5. And in stats, the meaning is the same. So in this dairy and productivity example, if you have a slope of negative 0.5, that means for every one gram of dairy you eat, your productivity score decreases by 0.5%. Or if we look at the weight versus height example, if the slope is 2.5, that tells you for every inch you grow, you will gain on average two and a half pounds. Boy, that's some good information. We are learning so much about our data. And now that we have a slope and an intercept, we can use that information to actually predict the future. So if I plan to eat an entire pizza today, that is not outside the realm of possibility, Unfortunately, I can predict what my future productivity score will be tomorrow. So let's just say a pizza has 200 grams. I'm totally making that number up, I have no idea. And the slope of our model is negative 0.35. Then all we have to do is simple arithmetic. Negative 0.35 times 200 grams plus 85 is equal to 15. So if I eat a whole pizza today, my productivity score is gonna be 15%. I'm gonna suck tomorrow but it was worth it. Quick summary, y'all. In algebra, we have y is equal to mx plus b, where m is the slope, b is the y-intercept. In statistics, it's the same. We just use different symbols. b1 is the slope, which tells you how much we expect the outcome to change for every change in the predictor. b0 is the intercept, which tells you the predicted value of someone who scores zero on the predictor. And we can use that awesome information to predict somebody's score. Summary over. But let's do one more example, shall we? Let's say you just found out that you have cancer. Gum summit, I was hoping to live. And you wanna know, hey, I got cancer. What's the probability that I'm gonna be dead in six months? And so maybe you find a data set where they sampled lots and lots of people who have a similar sort of cancer. They find out how much those people exercise per day and then later compute the probability for various levels of exercise. And here is our awesome graphic. So in this example, the regression line is probability of death is equal to 56.8% plus negative 0.67 times minutes exercised a day. So again, what do these numbers mean? This tells us that if we do not exercise at all, we have a 56.8% chance of dying. I don't like them odds, how about you? But what does the slope tell us? That tells us for every minute you exercise, your probability of dying decreases by 0.67%. So if you exercise for 60 minutes a day in this example, your chances of dying from cancer are 15.8%. I'll take that. But here's the thing, sometimes the numbers we're looking at are totally meaningless. Let us say that we are looking at the relationship between depression and relationship satisfaction. 
And let's say that depression is measured on some sort of a Likert scale. And your responses on these Likert scales are eventually summed up, and so by the end, the scale means absolutely nothing. Except that higher scores mean more depression, lower scores mean less depression. And let's assume that relationship satisfaction is the same. It's just the summed up values of all the different Likert items. So again, in the end, if you have like a 57 on relationship satisfaction, what does that mean? I don't know. And let's say after doing that, we run our model and we find that the estimates come out to be satisfaction is equal to 29.97 minus 0.75 times depression. So every time you increase in depression units, whatever those units mean, we can expect our relationship satisfaction to decrease by 0.7 points on the relationship satisfaction scale. But again, we don't even know what those numbers really mean. So what does this regression equation tell us? Basically nothing. Because again, the scales are arbitrary. All it says is that you decrease in relationship satisfaction the more depressed you are. But we want some estimates, people! So in situations like this, when the scale of one or both variables is arbitrary, interpreting the slope and the intercept probably doesn't make any sense. Instead, we use an estimate that gives us information regardless of what the scale is. And that brings us to the correlation coefficient. So the correlation coefficient is a number that ranges from negative one to positive one. Negative one means we have a perfect negative relationship, like the distance your head is from a basketball hoop, given your height. Because really, all people who are six feet tall, guess what? They're gonna be four feet from the basketball hoop. The taller you are, the less the distance is between your head and the basketball hoop. And this happens to be a perfect relationship. So that is a perfect negative relationship. What about a perfect positive relationship? So for perfect positive relationships, the correlation coefficient is going to be plus one. Like in this example, height in inches versus height in centimeters. Because the taller you are in inches, the taller you are in centimeters. Makes sense. So that's negative one and positive one. And right in the middle we have zero. Zero means there is no relationship between the two variables. So an example of a zero relationship is your value as a human being versus your score on the next statistics exam. Because even if you fail, I still love you. So there's no relationship. You're still valuable no matter what you score on my stats exam. Like I said, the correlation coefficient ranges between negative one and positive one, but it can fall anywhere in between. Typically, we consider a correlation of around plus or minus 0.1 to be a small correlation, like the correlation between sleep and stress. And a correlation around plus or minus 0.3 we consider moderate, like maybe the relationship between exercise and feelings of well-being. A correlation of plus or minus 0.5 we would consider strong, like the relationship between the number of hours studied and your exam score. And occasionally we get super duper amazing, awesome, strong correlations, like positive 0.9. For example, the relationship between how much you like, share, subscribe, and comment, and your happiness in all facets of life. It's a scientifically proven fact, y'all. And now you have the necessary background to understand a joke I've been wanting to tell you since the beginning of the semester. Here's a love letter I wrote to my wife when I was bored in church one day. Our relationship, strong, positive, and nearly perfect. Oh, shucks. Aren't I a sweetie? So let's do another quick summary, shall we? So we like graphics, but we want cold, hard numbers. So if we're looking at the relationship between two numeric variables, a couple of numbers might be of interest, like the intercept, which is the predicted value of the outcome when the predictor is exactly zero. The slope, which is the amount of change we expect in the outcome every time we change on the predictor. And finally, the correlation coefficient, which ranges from negative one to positive one. Negative one means a perfect negative relationship, positive one means a perfect positive relationship, and zero means no relationship. But what about categorical variables, you ask? Glad you asked! I'm so excited to talk about this. Remember, with categorical variables, we often have groups, and we want to see whether two groups differ on some sort of outcome variable. And when you have groups, usually what you're interested in is the mean of each group. For example, we may want to see the relationship between cholesterol and whether people exercise or not. So the mean of those who exercise is 191, and the mean of those who do not exercise is 199. 
But really, usually we don't care about what the means of each of the individual groups are. We're looking at a relationship, people! What we really care about is the difference in means between the two groups. So in this case, we have 199 minus 191, or 8. In other words, the two groups differ in their cholesterol by 8 points on average. Let's visualize this sucker, shall we? So again, the mean of exercise group is 191, and the mean of the no exercise group is 199. Now let's just pretend that we are going to draw a line from the mean of the no exercise group to the mean of the exercise group. What does that look like? Boy, that looks a whole lot like a scatter plot. You bet it does. It turns out that's exactly what it is. It's a scatter plot. Except the data have been jittered. And it turns out it's exactly the same. Because a mean difference between the two groups is nothing more than a slope. Remember, the slope tells you how much the outcome is expected to change when we have a one unit change on our predictor. And in this situation, we've changed the value of our predictor by one point. We are treating the yes to exercise group as zero and the no to exercise group as one. And now the change in cholesterol is eight points. So again, a group difference is nothing more than a slope. So you remember how at the beginning of the semester, I kind of sort of made a big deal about how there are two types of variables? Numeric! Categorical. It turns out that a lot of times that distinction isn't necessary. We treat them the same. We just might think about it a little differently, and that's okay. Now, what is the intercept for categorical predictors, you ask? You probably didn't ask, but I'm inviting you to ask. Remember, the intercept means it is the score on the outcome when the predictor is zero. And you remember earlier I said one of the groups, the exercise group, is treated as if they have a score of zero. So the intercept is actually the mean of the exercise group. I don't know why I did that. But remember, with categorical variables, there's no inherent order. We could have just as easily decided that the no exercise group was zero and the exercise group was one. Doesn't matter. What does matter is that we call one of them, either of them zero, and the other one we call one. And the change from the no exercise group to the exercise group is one unit change, and the difference between those groups tells us what the slope is. So, for categorical variables, we have a slope, which is the same thing as the mean difference between the two groups. And we also have an intercept, which is just the mean of the zero group, whichever group that happens to be. And just like before, we can use the regression equation to predict somebody's score. So what is our best guess of somebody who belongs in the non-exercise group? Again, we're gonna take 191, which is the intercept, and add to it eight, which is the slope, and multiply that by whatever group they're in. And remember, the exercise group now has a score of one, and so when we solve the equation, we get 199, which is just the mean of the exercise group. Now we're getting it. Either that or everybody's lost and I have no idea. So we got an intercept and we got a slope for categorical variables. What about a correlation coefficient? Kinda, sorta. You actually can compute the correlation coefficient, but there's a better metric to use. Let's think about an example, shall we? Let's say we're looking at the relationship between exercise and depression, and we have a exercise group and a no exercise group. Now, what if I told you that the slope or the difference in averages between the two groups is 115, what would you say? Dang, exercise works! Or does it? Let's look at a graph, and maybe that'll give us some information. Now do you think 115 is a big difference? Now let's look at another graph where 115 is a big difference. Dang, exercise works! So you notice what's happening? A value of 115 is meaningless unless you know the spread of the two groups, or the variance. So in these graphs, the mean difference, 115, was exactly the same, but the difference was the spread. If the spread is large, the difference is probably gonna be small. If the spread is tiny, then the difference is gonna look massive. So there's actually a statistic we can use to account for that fact. And this metric allows us to standardize the differences between groups so that they are all on a common scale no matter what variables you're measuring. But instead of ranging from negative one to positive one like the correlation coefficient is, that metric is actually a little different. This metric is called Cohen's D, after the great Jacob Cohen. Remember that guy? And this value is expressed in standard deviation units. So if you have a Cohen's D of 1.5, that means one group is 1.5 standard deviations different than the other group. I still don't get it. Hey, that's okay. I know it's not intuitive yet to think in terms of standard deviation units, but it will make a little more sense when we start talking about probability. But just to give you a quick preview, there's a way we can convert from standard deviation units into probabilities. How then do you interpret a Cohen's D? 
Well, generally, if Cohen's D is about 0.2, we say it's a small effect. If the difference between the two groups has a Cohen's D of 0.5, we consider it a moderate effect. And if Cohen's D is about 0.8 or larger, that's considered a pretty big effect. So that about wraps it up now. Now let's review our learning objectives. Number one, understand what the following mean. Intercept, slope, correlation coefficient, group mean difference, and Cohen's D. Really though, understand what they mean or what do those numbers tell you about your data? Never forget, it's about what your data are trying to tell you. Deal? Also, understand the relationship between a mean difference and a slope. They're the same thing. Also, understand what the benchmarks are for a small, medium, and large correlation, as well as a small, medium, and large Cohen's D. And finally, understand how to use the slope and the intercept to predict someone's score. With that, peace out. Thank <laughs> you.